of the uh, the this part uh, uh, things you may not know about the Beatles. Was it, is this a, actually a website called Things You May Not Know About the Beatles? <clears throat> so the, the deal with social media is that you're supposed to be you know it's you follow your friends or your, you know, you follow the page of this TV show or you follow whatever. And, and that's what you're supposed to see, but, but they don't make money off that. So they just, like, I go on Facebook and it's, hey, here's a post from my brother. Here's 44 posts from crap I don't care about. <laughs> Half of them are ads for things that I would buy if I were, if I had more money than brains, I would totally buy the recreation of Indiana Jones's dad's grail diary from the third Indiana Jones movie. But I'm not spending. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? I'm not spending forty bucks on a replica of a book from a movie. I mean, as much as I want this, oh, you know, I mean, the the my inner golem is going. My precious, I want, I want my precious. You know, it's going. It's it's the responsible adult going. Okay, you'd look through it once, put it on a shelf, die. The kids would go, "What the crap is this?" and throw it away. Right. So, right. as I was looking on Facebook, checking the service group to see if there were any questions I may have missed, this random suggested for me popped up about, you know, little known facts about the Beatles, and I'm going, and, and I'm going, oh, okay, you know, I got a second, I'll read this, and then I got to the bit that I got to, and I went, oh, well, this is going up to Dave. Yes, have you, have you told anybody about this, or can I just sort of read it cold here? You can read it cold. All right. Uh, things you may not know about the Beatles. The band had its first British performance under the name Beatles on December 17, 1960, at Liverpool's Casbah Coffee Club. After I it wasn't too good, said Paul. Everyone needed a rest. I expected everyone to be ringing me to discuss what we were doing. It was all quiet on the Western Front. None of us called each other, so it wasn't so much dejected as puzzled, wondering whether it was going to carry on, or if that was the last of it. I started working at a coil winding factory called Massey and Coggins. My dad had told me to go out and get a job. I said, I've got a job. I'm in a band. But after a couple of weeks of doing nothing with the band, it was, no, you have to get a proper job. He virtually chucked me out of the house. Get a job, but don't come back. So I went to the employment office and said, can I have a job? Just give me anything. I said, I'll have whatever is on the top of that little pile there. And the first job was sweeping the yard at Massey and Cargins. I took it. I went there and the personnel officer said, we got to have you sweeping the yard. You're management material. And they started to train me from the shop floor up with that in mind. Of course, I wasn't very good on the shop floor. I wasn't a very good coil line. One day, John and George showed up in the yard that I showed up in the yard that I should have been sweeping, and told me that we had a gig at the cabin. I said, "No, I've got a steady job here, and it pays uh, seven pounds seven fourteen a week. They're training me here. That's pretty good. I can't expect more." And I was quite serious about this. But then, with my dad's warning still in mind, I thought, "Sod it! I can't stick this lot." I bumped over the wall, was never seen again by Matthew and Cogger. <laughs> Pretty shrewd move, really, as things turned out. The Beatles' first show since Hamburg was at Mona Bess Casbah Coffee Club, a venue they hadn't played at since the Quarrymen days in October 1959. Stuart Sutcliffe had remained in Hamburg with uh, Astrid Kirchner, so the Beatles recruited Chaz Newby, formerly the rhythm guitarist with the Blackjacks, to play bass. Now, that's interesting. Why wasn't Paul playing bass? That was his instrument, wasn't it? Anyway, uh, the Beatles borrowed equipment from the other act that was booked to play that night, Gene Day and the Django Beats. And that's the one that you've got in boldface, enlarged, and underlined <laughs> with good reason. Gene Day, exactly the way Gene Day spelled his name, and the Django Beats, who later renamed themselves Earl Preston and the TTs, uh, which is 
interesting. Uh, postals, posters declaring the Beatles direct from Hamburg, Germany, were placed around the Casbah, and the basement venue was crammed with people expecting to see a German band perform. Many were disappointed when John, Paul, and George took the stage. Once they began playing, however, it was clear that a transformation had occurred during their time in Germany. The crowd went wild. The Beatles performed sensationally, and Beatlemania in Britain began to get underway. Uh, oh, Gene Day and the Django Beats, you say, in quotation marks with a question mark. Is this a factoid Dave Sim knew? Uh, no, no, first I heard of it. Uh, did Gene Day know? And it's like, uh, no. Uh, what, what does it all mean with a question mark? Uh, Matt, Matt will refrain. I don't think Matt should refrain from this. Will refrain from pointing out that in the Star Wars prequel films, the original film's mysterious badass, Boba Fett's father is introduced, Django Fett. Uh, <laughs> did George Lucas know this factoid? <laughs> what period does period, it period, all period, mean question mark, exclamation mark, question mark. And how does it tie into the strange death of Alex Freeman, question mark. Because you know it does. Everything does eventually. Uh, I, th I think there's got to, there's got to be a link there where, uh, Django brought nothing to mind for me. So, you know, the Django beats, where did they get the name Django? How does this tie in with, uh, uh Gene Day? Um, uh, Django Fett is probably as, as, uh, Good a guess as any. Uh, that's a whole whole stream of consciousness for you OCD Star Wars fans. As anything else, it's like uh, if I was looking at it, <coughs> um, I would I would break it up into the three parts. Uh, ja, ja, which is yes in German, and which is and and go beat. Ya and go, which is exactly what happened. They're, they're from, they, they come from Hamburg, Germany. They passed all of their tests and uh, it's ya and go. Um, Jean Day uh, is one of the, that, that's, that's an interesting name um, because uh, it's it's gene in uh, the genetic sense, like your gene. Uh, everybody has, you know, um, their genetic material is made up of gene. So gene day is the dawning of a new genetic whatever it is, which certainly, arguably, the um, the Beatles were. It was uh, um, what it, whatever part of the human genome and aspects of us genetically, um, androgyny is definitely something in that category. Androgyny married with the backbeat of uh of rock and roll um uh, takes it to another level so you do end up with capital g capital d gene day which makes you know uh Cerebus and dave sim um a a reply to that because you know gene day was definitely the the fulcrum of that. Uh, it's significant that, no, I never heard of this. I never heard Gene Day mention this. Uh, I've never read this anywhere. You've never read this anywhere. And you read it in 2023, which is uh, 49 years, seven, seven, seven times seven, since uh, I connected with Gene Day for the first time. Uh, which is interesting because it means there was a real Gene Day in the Dave Sims Cerebus concert.
context. Gene Day was actually his name, whereas the Beatles' Gene Day was a made-up name. There wasn't a Gene Day, or presumably there wasn't a Gene Day because they later renamed themselves Earl Preston and the TT. So I assume that they were they were making up a uh, a lead name, although we don't know that. Was there was there an actual uh, Gene Day and the Django Beats where the lead singer was Gene Day and he got replaced by Earl Preston? But it is interesting that there's a real Gene Day uh, in the Dave Sam Service context and not, as far as we can tell, a real Gene Day in the Beatles context at, uh, at this um, epicenter moment. And, you know, you, we, we have to remember that, uh, you know, anytime that the Beatles come up, uh, the whole Cerebus thing happened and would not have happened if Dave Sem didn't have George Harrison die. Uh, to Denny Lubert, because if there was any, there's any expert on the planet of what George Harrison's eyes looked like, it was Denny Lubert, for whom George Harrison was her favorite Beatle. Um, so the fact that uh, I had George Harrison's eyes. And Denny came into Now and Then Books because she was interested in doing a magazine like Dark Shadows. And, you know, talked about this pretty extensively. And I'm going, Dark Shadows, no, that's the uh, television show. And I asked her, do you mean Dark Fantasy? And she said, yes, Dark Fantasy. And that was Jean Day's fantasy. So it was definitely a fulcrum moment of George Harrison's eyes, uh, Gene Day, and um, this is this is the, um, the meeting point that uh, the Cerebus came out of. So, are you ready for the comic art metaphysics? It's, Beyond. it's definitely in that category. Oh, oh no, no. <laughs> No, no, it's not in the category. This is one of them, the, the pinball went right into the socket. So, Gene Day and the Django Beats. Gene Day did the Star Wars portfolio that was advertised in service number one that led to the cease and desist letter from Lucasfilm, which means Lucasfilm at some level, somebody knew the name Gene Day. But, ah. but wait, it gets even, you're... You're, I hope you're sitting down, Dave, because I forgot about this till we started talking about it. Gene Day penciled two issues of the Star Wars comic book, issues 68 and 69. Issue 68 has Boba Fett on the cover. Boba Fett's dad is Jango Fett. And issue 68, the editor is Louise Jones. <laughs> You couldn't make that up. You know, it, I jokingly uh, said, how does this tie into the strange death of Alex Raymond? Because, you know, it's a joke, but at the same time, it's one of those, you start pulling at that thread. <laughs> right. Uh, and the more that I thought about it, I mean, yeah, my, my jaw dropped open when I read your facts today, um, you know, prepping for this and going, oh, this is interesting. What, what's this all about? And I hit uh, Gene Day and the Django Beats. It's uh, one of the differences between uh, the Beatles and Cerebus, apart from you know orders of magnitude and popularity for the Beatles compared to Cerebus, is that um, it is a it's a very very long Cerebus is a much longer narrative. Uh, the Beatles was a 7-7, um, um, 1956 to 1970. Uh, this is when it starts, this is when it, this is when it comes to an end. It turns into other things, it's definitely remembered, but the actual 
school, uh, it starts here and finishes there, um, was 14 years. Service is 26 years. And consequently, you get things like this where um, the information obviously existed, Gene Day and the Django leads. Um, when did Paul McCartney first mention it? I'm, I'm assuming that uh, Paul McCartney was, was the source of this, where uh, he and the other Beatles are probably the only guys who knew, um, you know, if you ask, uh, uh, who, who played bass um, uh, at the uh, at the Cosmo, the first uh, Beatles um, uh, performance? And they would have gone, oh, that was Chaz Newsby, you know, former uh, rhythm guitarist with the, with the Blackjacks. Um, the information existed; it was in their mind. It was it was part of their own legend. Uh, they probably told any number of people about it and would have mentioned it in conversation with each other. But at the same time, it, uh, it submerged and doesn't emerge until, like I say, uh, 49 years, 7-7, seven, seven, after my connection to, to Gene Day got established, which is, I mean, I'm going to take this as uh, no, Dave, you're, you're, you're not done. And you're on the right track. Just keep going. And uh, more of these things are going to, going to start cropping up. And, and like you said, you know, I have no idea that, uh, or had no idea that I, I wouldn't know Bob a fed if he came up and bit me on the ass. <laughs> um, and I certainly wouldn't have known that that was who Gene Day penciled in issues 68 and 69 of Star Wars. Um, and it was, like you say, it was edited by Louise Jones, um, who, you know, we're just talking about here. And when was the last time that Louise Jones came up as a topic of conversation? And that's connected through Michael R. That's, uh, that came in my mail yesterday. It's, uh, uh, there, there's Louise Jones as she is today. And as she was uh, four days before my birthday when uh, Michael R. got, uh, got the copy of uh, Sarah's archive uh, personalized to me. It's, uh, uh, there are beyond coincidences. It's uh, trying to explain it as Oh, it's just a coincidence. That just means um, it, it uh, two two things uh, coincided. And uh, no, there's a there's a this is how God's reality is built. This is God's clockwork mechanism, and it's it's everywhere around us. And sometimes it just makes itself uh, more more apparent than others. I'm, I'm going to try to track down and see if I can... I'm sure some Beatles fan has a picture of the original poster that was posted at the at the club when they played. And I'm, I'm going to track it down and, you know, verify the information. Because it could be maybe somebody, you know, maybe the band wasn't called that. Somebody just transcribed it wrong. But the fact that they transcribed it wrong, it suggested by the algorithm for me to see it. It's it's it go ahead. It's definitely one of those. I mean, like I said, I saw it and went, "Well, that's interesting." Ninety percent of the time, I would have went, "Eh, I'll remember to tell Dave next time I have to fax something." But because I was in the middle of writing the fax, I'm like, "Well, okay, let's put it in now." Definitely, definitely. It's just one of those. Just the fact that it, it existed all the way along, but uh, there comes the time. This is a, a major element to me of God's clockwork mechanism is uh, this will be a very interesting and gratifying and validating moment for you, Dave, but you're going to have to put in 49 years to, to earn it. And uh, that to me is, is, 
is one of those things. It's, that's why it's uh, it's a matter of, of never give up. Why uh, um, faith and endurance and perseverance are, are so important because uh, there's always something just up ahead that if you just do everything right, you will coincide with it. Um, but if you don't do everything right, it's like your life is also full of uh, missed opportunity where it's just all the hell with it. I just, it, 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 it uh, this is all beyond me and I'm giving up for today. Well, if you haven't given up today, you had this major thing rolling down, it's been rolling down towards you for the last 49 years, um, waiting to intersect with you, but uh, you're just ships passing in the night. Again, I think that's why this is this is all God's comedian of uh, and what what they do to themselves, right? the the uh, the blessings that they do accrue compared to the blessings that they could accrue if they would just do the right thing, do do exactly what you think is the right thing, persevere, have faith and endurance, and you're you're just gonna you're just gonna get buried. In Right. Okay, we didn't we didn't bring it in at two hours. We brought it in at two and a half hours. But I I think we did pretty good. Well, we have had some shorter ones, so you know, now we're giving the fans what they crave. <laughs> the people who crave, uh, please hold for Dave Sim. Here's here's a whole bunch for you. <laughs> so, thanks thanks as always, Matt. Say hi to. Uh, Paula and uh, and Bullwinkle and Janet Pearl for me, and uh, we will uh, we will we will do this again, God willing, at uh, at the beginning of July. Correct. Have a good night, Dave. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye bye.